Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We praise you for your word, which is the truth. And we do receive it this night, written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation of the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. I began sharing with you this morning on the subject of understanding the doctrine of baptisms. And we're going to be going over what we talked about tonight. And then also talking about, more specifically, about water baptism and covering a lot of scriptures that are thought to be somewhat controversial scriptures that people have not understood so that you understand about the true doctrine regarding baptisms. Hebrews 6 verse 1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, and of the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. These are all doctrines. The doctrine here, it says this is, it means actually a teaching. It's a teaching about baptisms, understanding about baptisms. It's used, the word baptism is used many, many times throughout the New Testament, and certainly it's something that we need to understand. Now we mentioned, and we'll cover some of the things we talked about this morning. In Ephesians chapter 4, we saw over in verse 4, as you just saw that Hebrews 6, 2, where a doctrine of baptisms, plural, in verse 4, it's speaking about listing out the spiritual things that God has established. And it says, begins in verse 4, there's one body, that's the spiritual body, the body of Christ. One spirit, the Holy Spirit. Even as you're called in one hope, one spiritual hope of your calling. One Lord, we have one Lord, Jesus. One faith, it's a spiritual faith. You either are in faith or you're not operating in faith. One baptism. Well, we saw the doctrine of, or teaching of baptisms. What does this mean? There's more than one baptism that the word teaches about, but here it talks about one baptism. And it's interesting when you look up the word one, as we pointed out this morning, in these other places, you see it's talking about one body, one spirit, one hope. It's interesting, here it uses this word mia, only one hope. These other places, it uses the word for one general word. Then we come to baptism, and it means only one baptism. It is a Greek word, mia. That means there's only one spiritual baptism that has effect upon your life. The doctrine of baptisms is something we need to know, the teaching about it, so we understand it clearly, but there's only one spiritual baptism that has an effect upon your life, and that is important. Now, we looked at, and we'll look at some of the scriptures we looked at this morning, for those of you who were not here, in Matthew chapter 3, we saw how John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness, and he declared, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or more literally, it has come nigh. Because this is a perfect tense verb, which means action completed in the past with existing results at, at the time of the speaking, which means the kingdom of heaven was in force at that moment, and it had been brought into being in the past from the point of speaking. Repent. The kingdom of the heavens, it's here, he's saying. And then John says, this is he, <coughs> the word says, this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. So this one, who was John the Baptist, he was the fulfillment of this, was declaring here that he was this one, and he was to prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. So he was to walk in. And we see that it says in verse 5 that they went out to Jerusalem and Judea and all the region round about Jordan, were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So these people were confessing their sins when they were coming to be baptized, as we see. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came out as well to his baptism. And he says in verse 8, Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. That means if you truly have repentance, it's going to be shown by your fruit. So you can't just say you repent and not have the action or the fruit, evidence of it. Evidence is the fact that there is change, because the word repentance means change, a change of mind, which is going to cause a change of action. And he comes to verse 10, he says, Now also is the axe laid into the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. God expects us to bring forth fruit. And those that have true repentance are the ones that are going to be shown forth by the fruits in their life. 
And as he was bringing forth about being, baptism, being baptized, they were confessing their sins. Otherwise, they were coming to the place of repentance and dealing with the sins in their life, showing that repentance was, a, was a, uh, something that preceded them getting baptized. Otherwise, it was a condition that they needed to repent, turn, and change away, change and turn away from all areas of sin. Now, we saw over in John something that was important. In John's account, we saw in verse 19, where this is the record of John, when the Jews sent the priests and the Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? They wanted to know who he was. <clears throat> and notice it was the priests and the Levites. Those were the ones that were priests and of the Levitical tribe, so they all had the right to the priesthood. They wanted to know who he was. And he said he wasn't the Christ. He wasn't Elias. He wasn't some other prophet. He denied all that. And he said, who art thou that we may give an answer to them that sent us? And what sayest thou of thyself? Well, he proceeded to tell him. He was the fulfillment of Isaiah 40, verse 3, the one who was crying in the wilderness, making straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah had said. And these were all, these guys were sent of the Pharisees. And so then they come down and they said, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not the Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? They saw what he was doing. He was baptizing. Why are you doing this if you're not this particular one that we're looking for? Because this points out that they were realizing that something was supposed to happen if he was going to be the one baptized. And they thought it was going to be the Christ because they thought the kingdom was going to be coming. And he said, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you know not. And he comes down to it and he says in verse 31, or verse 33, he says, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. Here we see a change that now there's going to be one who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. In Matthew's account, he makes it very clear, in a, really a prophetic statement, where he said, I indeed baptize with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So, what's he revealing? He's revealing the fact that there's a change in the way what happened in the Old Testament to the New Testament. Because they were used to washing or the baptizing. And why was that? Because these guys were the ones who were the priests, and they understood how you came into the priestly ministry. But now John the Baptist was bringing this forth, baptizing all the people. Why was that? Because of the fact of the prophecy of Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you'll obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Otherwise, the prophecy was that the kingdom was going to come and they would be a kingdom of priests. Well, what, what was so significant here if he's calling them to repent, saying the kingdom now has come? The kingdom's come, that meant we also are going to now all be priests, every single one. And so, what was John the Baptist doing, baptizing? Why was he doing this? It's important that we understand that these were the steps to come into the priesthood. There were three steps. In Leviticus chapter 8, we see in verse 6, the first step. Moses brought Aaron and his sons, washed them with water. The first thing was the washing with water. The second thing that had to be done, in verse 12, poured the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him and sanctified him. So first there was the washing, second there was the anointing. The third thing that had to be done for these to come into the priesthood, they brought the other ram, the ram of consecration. Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the ram. He slew it, and Moses took of the blood of it and put it upon the tip of Aaron's right ear, upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. And he brought Aaron's sons, and Moses put the blood upon the tip of their right ear, and upon the thumbs of their right hands, and upon the great toes of their right feet. Why? Because those are your members which sin. And so what do we see was happening? We see the fact that these guys had been going through the three steps for entering the priesthood. There was the washing, there was the anointing, and there was the application of the blood. And so what was John the Baptist doing? He was doing the washing, or what was called, what was called baptizing them with water as they were confessing their sins. That was the first step. That's what was going on. See, they didn't come out and say, you know, why, what are you doing out here? They already knew what John the Baptist was doing because he was taking them through these particular steps. 
Well, we saw after that that Jesus came, and in Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus comes along to Galilee, it said he came to John to be baptized of him. Well, he just had the word, the fact that Jesus was going to come, he was going to baptize everyone but one with the Holy Spirit. John's response was, he forbade me, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and you comest thou to me? And Jesus said, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. righteousness. What was the righteousness being fulfilled of? It was the righteousness of the law to come into the priesthood. Jesus could not be a priest in the Old Testament because he was of the tribe of Judah. But he was, had to go through the steps and what are these steps? The steps were first the washing, then the anointing, and then the application of the blood. So what happened? Jesus was baptized. He was baptized, went straight away out of the water. Heavens were open unto him, the Spirit of God descending like a dove, lighting upon him. So the first thing was the baptism or the washing. What's the second thing? The anointing. What happened here? The Holy Spirit came upon him. That's the anointing, the second thing. And what was the third thing that happened for him to be the priest? And remember, he couldn't be a priest in the Old Testament era because he wasn't of the tribe of Levi. Well, when he went to the cross, the third part was fulfilled. Because here's where, and we pointed this out this morning, that when they took him to the cross, Matthew 27, 29, they plaited a crown of thorns to put it upon his head. The thorns would dig into his head and the blood would begin to run. And the blood would run down to the tip of the right ear. And they also crucified him, nailing his hands to the cross. His blood would spurt out to the right thumb and spurt out when they nailed his feet to the right toe, or the great toe of the right foot. Jesus fulfilled this for, to fulfill all righteousness, revealing to them he was to be the priest. It was fulfill all righteousness. Of course, as we pointed out, could anybody be a priest who was of the tribe of Judah? No. So what did that mean? There had to be something new. First of all, there had to be a new covenant, we pointed out. We gave the scripture out of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, where now, in chapter 31, he had prophesied that there was going to be a new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. A new one. Under the old covenant, Jesus couldn't become the high priest. But now a new covenant would come. And Jesus declared that at the Last Supper when he said, this is the blood of the New Testament which is going to be shed for many for the remissions of sins. So he is the one who brought forth the new covenant. But there would also have to be a change in the priesthood. And we see that there was a change in the priesthood as we saw in Hebrews chapter 7 over in verse 11 where it says, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, they couldn't do it, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek, it's a different order, and not to be called after the order of Aaron? The Old Testament was after the order of Aaron. Well, the New Testament, the New Covenant, was now after a different order. It was after the order of Melchizedek. And who was Melchizedek? Melchizedek was a king, and he was a priest. In the Old Testament, one person could be a king or they could be a priest, but you couldn't be both. The order of Melchizedek was be the fact that you would be a king and a priest. So that's why the priesthood had to be changed, as it says in verse 12. The priesthood being changed. There was made a change now. And so the priesthood was after the order of Melchizedek. But also, how did you get into the priesthood? We pointed out the fact that the way into the priesthood is by birth by physical birth of the tribe of Levi. God doesn't change things as far as the way things come in. It's still got to be by birth. That's the way you come into something. But now we have a new covenant. And so how is the way into the priesthood now? It was for everybody because of the prophecy of Exodus 19 that everybody was going to be a priest now. It was also through birth, but it was through spiritual birth. And Jesus revealed a statement in Luke chapter 12 talking about a cup that he had to drink and a baptism he had to be baptized with. He says here, first of all, in verse 50, I have a baptism to be baptized with and baptized with, and how I am pressed or straightened till it be accomplished. 
because he was going to have to go through the avenue of death before this baptism would occur. And it really was a baptism that was a baptism of, from un, unto death that would then produce a baptism unto life. And we see another place, it's over in Matthew chapter 20, speaking of this. In Matthew 20, we pick up in verse 22, and here's where Jesus said, Are you able to drink the cup that I shall drink of? Which is what? The cup of death. And to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. They say unto him, we're able. But the cup he's talking about is not just physical death. He's talking about spiritual death. Because, of course, the next verse he says, You shall indeed drink of my cup. He's not talking about physical death. He's talking about spiritual death. And be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. He's not talking about physical washing baptism. He's talking about spiritual baptism. There was going to be a spiritual death and there was going to be a spiritual baptism that was going to come to pass. And this is exactly what happened to Jesus. We've talked about how Jesus on the cross was made sin. From that, he went down to hell for three days and three nights paying the price for sin, accomplishing redemption. After that, Jesus was born from the dead, as we pointed out. Being born from the dead in hell, where he got a brand new spirit, we see that this is how he came into the priesthood. Because we see this statement made in Hebrews 5, 5, where it says this, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest. <clears throat> he didn't do something himself to be made a high priest. But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Otherwise, how did he become a high priest? He got born to be a high priest. And in the New Covenant, it was through spiritual birth. The word begotten means to be born. And then he goes on and says, <clears throat> he saith also in another place, thou art <clears throat> a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Meaning he was born a priest and born into what? The order of Melchizedek. That priesthood, which was a spiritual priesthood now. <clears throat> so, the way now into the priesthood is by spiritual birth. That's how he came in. And we see also, we pointed out several scriptures, but we'll look at a couple of them. In Colossians 1.15, speaking of Jesus, who's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Or this is the word for creation or creature. It's the same word used in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If you look at this, number 2937, we'll run over and look at it, show you, where it speaks of, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Same exact word, catesis, showing the fact that what happened? Jesus became the firstborn of every creature. And who's that talking about? Everybody who's born again. And he is the firstborn. You and I come into being a firstborn because everybody who's born again comes into the church of the firstborn, which means you're a firstborn, whether you realize it or not. Firstborn of every creation. And this is the foundation of the church because it says in verse 18, he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. How do we come into it? We're the firstborn from the dead. So Jesus, he is has this cup he drinks, which is a spiritual death, and he has this baptism, which is the presence of the Holy Spirit coming upon him and bringing a new spirit into him when he was baptized by the Holy Spirit down in hell, bringing him the firstborn from the dead. Well, you and I also, we are separated, we go through spiritual death in a sense, that our old spirit is going to be eliminated and taken out because that's what happened with Jesus. He got a new spirit, and we get a new spirit when we're born again. That's what happens. The old spirit's gone. Remember what he said? He said it was the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. And remember, this baptism of the Holy Spirit is what produces the new birth. Matthew 3.11, where he talked about he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Fire consumes and burns things up. What gets burned up and eliminated? The old spirit is eliminated and you get a brand new spirit. So the old spirit's removed, <clears throat> a new spirit comes in. We go to the place where from spiritual death, that spirit's eliminated, and now 
We come into spiritual life having a brand new spirit when you and I are born again. And remember that we come, just as Jesus came into the priesthood of the order of Melchizedek, what happens when you and I are born again? We come into that same priesthood. How do we know that we've come into that priesthood? Because of what it says in Revelations 1, 5, and 6, where it says it calls him the first begotten or firstborn of the dead. He's the first. And how he loved us and washed us from our own sins in his own blood, and he made us kings and priests. Well, that means we had to be in the same priesthood he's in, that, that we are, the Melchizedek priesthood, which is the ones who's a king and a priest. So you've been born again, the firstborn now, in the, when you're born again, you come into the priesthood. Everybody is now a priest, not just one tribe, everybody who's born again. And you and I are now kings and priests unto God. What happened to us? We get a new spirit and a new heart. This is actually prophesied by Ezekiel. Over in Ezekiel, chapter 36, he gave a prophecy. And he says, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. That's what happens when you're born again. You get a brand new spirit, you get a brand new heart. The old spirit is taken out and eliminated, and you get a brand new spirit and a new heart. And what's, been, what's happened? You were baptized by the Holy Spirit and brought you into the body of Christ. We talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and pointed out this is a spiritual baptism. And it says in 1 Corinthians 4, 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now, if you remember, we talked about this morning, for you weren't here, the word baptize is an untranslated Greek word, baptizo. Baptizo, they just made an English word out of it, baptize. doesn't tell you what it means. It means to immerse, submerge, or engulf in something. So, by one Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, you and I are baptized into what? We come into one body. That's when we come and get born again. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, correctly understood, is the new birth when we get born again. The presence of God comes and immerses, and we are immersed or engulfed in the presence of God, and the Holy Spirit takes that old spirit out, it's burned up, and a new spirit comes in, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, and we've come into the order of Melchizedek priesthood and now are made kings and priests unto God. This is all because of spiritual baptism. Galatians 3, verse 27. For as many as you've been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Again, now this is not talking about water baptism. There are many people that have missed it and thought, well, this must be talking about water baptism thinking that water baptism brought me into Christ. Water baptism didn't bring you into Christ. It's a spiritual baptism that brought you into Christ. So this is talking about a baptism that brought us into Christ, which is the spiritual baptism by the Holy Spirit. We see in Romans 6 that we talked about this morning, briefly. Verse 3, Know ye not, to many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death. Because what happened? He the spirit he had was taken away, and a new spirit came into him. It's exactly what happened to us. Our spirit was taken away, and eliminated, and a brand new spirit, the spirit of Christ, came into us. Therefore, we're buried with him by baptism unto death, the old spirit gone, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, he was raised up, born the firstborn from the dead, even so we, we also are raised up from the dead, that now we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of His death, well, we should also be in the likeness of His resurrection, because you've experienced a resurrection spiritually. You have been born from the dead. You have a brand new spirit on the inside of you. So the baptism into Christ is the new birth, and the baptism to His death is speaking of the fact that that old spirit is eliminated. Now we have a new spirit on the inside of us. Now we're going to talk get into we'll talk more about water baptism tonight. And water baptism is something that we need to understand because of the fact that this is something we are to do. Water baptism is not going to bring you into the body of Christ. Remember, it's a spiritual baptism that brings you into that. 
First of all, we do need to take a look at this scripture in 1 Peter 3, verse 20, to understand what does water baptism do. It does have something, some benefit for us. It doesn't bring us into a new spirit, doesn't bring us into the body of Christ, but it's something that we to do, we're to do. 1 Peter 3.20 says, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering, suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Or the word by actually means through, it's the word dia. Saved through water. Well, what happened? This is talking about the flood, isn't it? And why did the flood come? Because the judgment was coming upon the world because of their ungodly ways. The world was full of ungodliness. So, Noah and his family, they got saved from the judgment that was coming on the world because of its sin. And then say, what, what's that got to do with baptism? Well, the next one says this is a like figure. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. It has a sa saving for us in a sense, which is what? Like the same thing. It saves us from the judgment that comes on the world because we aren't walking in the ways of the world any longer because baptism involves coming out of the ways of the world. Notice that what it is not. It is not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Baptism doesn't get rid of your sins. There's many people that teach that in many different ways. They, they even say, say if you're not baptized with water, you can't even be saved. You can't even be right with God. People teach that. It's false teaching. Baptism, water baptism, which is what this is talking about, is not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It doesn't get rid of it, wash away our sins. Spiritual baptism is what washed away our sins. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. In other words, this salvation is the keeping you from this judgment of the world because now you've come into relationship with God through spiritual baptism, and now you are showing an answer of a good conscience toward God by going through water baptism, which was what? Water baptism saved them from the judgment that was coming on those who were walking in sin in the world. Because what is it all about? Water baptism is a declaration before God that I am through with the world. I am not going to be walking in the ways of the world any longer. Remember when they came out of Egypt? There was the exodus out of Egypt. What did they do first? They had to eat the lamb. That's a type of receiving Jesus getting born again. And remember they had to have their staff in hand and they were up ready to go out and ready to move and get out of where they were. They were ready to leave something. So where were they? They were in Egypt. Egypt is a type of the world. When we get born again, we're to get up and leave the world, Egypt, a type of it. And how did they get out of there? They went through the sea, didn't they? That's all a type of what water baptism is all about. Water baptism, when you declare that before God and you, in water baptism that he is your Lord and that you belong to him, you're declaring to the world, because it's a public thing that you do to the world, I am through with you. I am not following you any longer. I am done with the ways of the world. In fact, if you try to get water baptized and you're going to continue in the ways of the world, <laughs> you are not realizing that you were but what it was all about, because it's all about the fact that you're leaving Egypt. You're leaving the world. You can't walk in the world any longer. It is a declaration before God that I am through with the world. We see over in 1 Corinthians in chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In verse 2, if it says, verse 1 says, Brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. What was the cloud? The cloud was the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Well, Moses is a type of Christ. And it's talking about these two different baptisms that we have, a spiritual baptism, <clears throat> the baptism by the Holy Spirit, which is the cloud, and also there's a water baptism, which is the baptism going through the sea. Here it's speaking of the two different baptisms. A spiritual baptism by the Holy Spirit brought us into the new birth. And then a water baptism, <clears throat> which is a declaration of we've been born again and that we are leaving the world system 
We are separating ourselves from all the things that are of the world. We are not going to walk in those ways any longer. There's many people that teach that you have to get baptized with water in order to be saved, to be born again. That is not true. Let's give a good example of that. Acts chapter 10. Here we are at Cornelius' house. Peter now has been directed to come and preach the gospel to them. <clears throat> and we see in verse 44, Philip, or Peter was speaking words whereby they might be saved. And in verse 44, Peter, while he spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word. They of the circumcision which believed were astonished. The falling upon them was the baptism of the Holy Spirit when they got born again. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Holy Ghost was also, on the Gentiles, also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, meaning that now they received the Holy Spirit as well. First they got born again, which is that the Holy Spirit falling upon them, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, they received the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in them, and they heard them speak with tongues. So they had the Holy Spirit with them, and now they're speaking in tongues. And then they said, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Were they baptized with water prior to this? No. So when did what's baptism with water have to do with? It has nothing to do with getting born again. It has <clears throat> nothing to do with receiving the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with getting your prayer language. <clears throat> A lot of people have taught out there, get baptized with water and the Holy Spirit's going to come into you when you come up out of there. People have taught that. It's a lie. It's not the truth. Lots of false traditions out there. Perhaps you've heard these kinds of things. No, we have come now to the place where water baptism is obedience to God, showing what has happened on the inside of us, and this is done after we're born again. It is not done before we're born again. It can be done after you're born again, whether you've received the Holy Spirit or not, whether you speak in tongues or not. It can be done after you've had all three of those, as we see here. It's just a separate experience. So otherwise, there isn't any prerequisite for you to, except for being born again, to be baptized with water. Some people think, you know, they got all their different religious means of why, how they do the things that they do. Not so. Now, baptism with water, as we pointed out this morning, and we'll look at these scriptures again briefly here, it is what follows believing on Jesus Christ. That means infant baptism. You're baptized as a baby, which many religious organizations have had people do. Did it do anything for you? No. Why? Because baptism follows believing. Can you believe when you're an infant? No, you don't even know what's going on yet. Therefore, it is not scriptural baptism. If you were baptized as a baby and you were never baptized with water after you've been, since you've been born again, then you do have not been baptized scripturally. And you would need to be baptized with water as the answer of a good conscience before God of what he has accomplished on you and declaring to the world and before God, I am through with the world and I am now going to follow the Lord and I am not going to have anything to do with the ways of this world. We looked at scriptures and we'll look at a few of these before we go to some other ones tonight. In Acts chapter 8, in verse 12, Philip preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. They believed, they got born again, and they were baptized, both men and women. Now, the baptism here followed having believed the things that he preached, being born again. We see another case that we looked at. This is with the Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch, where the eunuch, he approached, and verse 35, Philip opened his mouth, began to the same scripture that he found that he was looking at, and preached unto him Jesus. They went on their way, they came into the certain water, and the eunuch said, see, here's water, what hinders me to be baptized? He spoke about being baptized, the fact that you be leaving the ways of the world, and showing forth that you belong to the Lord. Well, Philip said, here's the prerequisite, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And what we believe with our heart, which he said he did, I answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he believed, he confessed it with his mouth, he got born again. Now that he was born again, what would happen? Then they commanded the chariot to stand still, went down both in the water and both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So the baptism was accomplished here by after he believed first. We saw the same thing we see over in Acts chapter 19, 9, verse 17. 
Acts 9, 17. Here's where Ananias is coming, and he speaks to Saul, Brother Saul. And he was coming to minister to him to be for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come upon him. And we see here, he says, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And here's where he came, and, and Brother Saul, meaning he was born again. And what happened to him? He said he fell from his eye, he fell from his eyes as had been scales, otherwise he got healed of the blindness, received his sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. So baptism followed him after being born again because he was brother Saul. Another case we see is we saw, and of course in Acts 10 already, that the baptism followed having getting born again, having the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues at Cornelius' house. We see another one over in Acts 16, verse 14. A certain woman named Lydia, seller of purple, the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened when she heard the gospel. She attended to the things that were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized, when did baptism occur? After she had believed and she was born again. We see the same thing happen over in the Philippian jail. When in Acts chapter 16, verse 30, after the doors were opened with the earthquake, yet they were still there, and the Philippian jailer said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Because they had preached the gospel to him. He said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's what produces salvation. You get a brand new spirit. And they spoke to him the word of the Lord, all that were in the house, took him the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and was baptized. Otherwise, again, baptism followed, having believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 18, over in verse 8, here it says, many of the Corinthians here, hearing, believed, and then what? And were baptized. Believing always precedes being baptized. We see also and over in Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, here when Paul came to Ephesus and found some disciples, he says in verse 2, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? So we know they were born again. They were already believers. They didn't even know where there was any Holy Spirit. He said, Unto then what were you baptized? They said, John's baptism. They were way be behind. They, they didn't know they were believers, but they didn't know anything about being baptized in the name of Jesus. Paul then said, Paul, John barely baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, then they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they had been baptized in that Old Testament baptism of repentance, but now that they believed in, in Jesus, where they were born again, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Again, this followed having believed on the Lord Jesus. Now, another thing that we see, when we talk about baptism and how it's accomplished, over in Matthew chapter 28, in Matthew 28, down in verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in, this is a word, ice in the Greek, which means into or unto, the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Again, as they preached the gospel to them, and they received that, then they were to be baptized. And what was this? Unto, or acknowledging that they'd come into the Godhead relationship, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that they had been born again. We also see that baptism was done in the name of Jesus, and there's people that say it's got to be done this way or that way, all these different things that they say. And there's lots of groups out there that say that you have to be baptized in a certain way, and some of them think that you're only supposed to be baptized in the name of Jesus only because they believe that Jesus is, there's only one God, and they don't believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 8, verse 16 speaks about how they were, have been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So when we baptize, we do baptize in the name of Jesus. Anybody that tells you don't be baptized in the name of Jesus, you're supposed to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, not so. We do baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Scripture shows that. We also see in Acts chapter 10, verse 48, it says, 
he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. So they, again, they did it in the name of the Lord. Another case was where we just saw in Acts 19, we just saw this, where it says they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That means that the baptism is done in the name of the Lord Jesus. At the, and why is that? We do everything in the New Testament in the name of Jesus. In fact, we even see this from Colossians 3, verse 17. It says, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. Everything we do, we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. We cast out demons in the name of Jesus. Whenever we do anything, any following, any command, we do things in the name of Jesus. We even see, for another example, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, when they were commanding them to, to withdraw from those that were walking disorderly, he said, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We do everything in the name of Jesus. Why? Because that's acknowledging him as the high priest and the Lord over the church. That's why we do everything in the name of Jesus. When we pray, remember that we pray now to the Father, as it says in John chapter 16, verse 23, he says, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, we're going to pray now to the Father in the name of Jesus. Why? Because we're coming through the high priestly ministry of Jesus. So the reason why we do everything in the name of Jesus is because of Jesus' position of high priest. And we're, so we're doing things in the name of Jesus in everything that we do. It's not just a thing about baptism. It's in everything that we do. All that we do in the name of Jesus. Now, so really it's acknowledging the fact that we have come into the new covenant. We've come into the church of the firstborn where Jesus now is the high priest. That's why we do the things we do. Also, we do it in the name of Jesus because we're acknowledging that we have come into the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek because he is the high priest. That's why we do the things that we do. Water baptism is also a testimony outward that the old you is dead and gone, and that there is a new you, the Spirit of Christ, on the inside of you. Colossians 3.3, you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. we got a brand new spirit on the inside. It's the old us is gone. we got a brand new spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. It's also a testimony, the fact that now, that we are dead to sin, we're dead to the old life, and we now have a brand new life. It talks about in Colossians 2.11, how what Jesus accomplished for us. In whom also you're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, that's of the heart, where you've got a brand new heart, brand new spirit. In putting off the body the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, remember, where we got a brand new spirit, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him, from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have he quickened together with him, has forgiven you all your trespasses. So now we've been quickened together. We've come into a new, we have a new spirit. We have now alive unto God. And we're dead to sins now. We're alive unto God. And now we're not a servant of sin any longer. Now we are a servant of righteousness. And so now we have come to the place of relationship with him. Another thing that it's important is remember when they came out of Egypt, who was, who was ruling over Egypt? Pharaoh. What's Pharaoh a type of in Scripture? Type of Satan. That means now when you are baptized in water, you are declaring to the world, I'm not under Satan's authority any longer because the world is under Satan's authority. He is the God of this world system. You are declaring, I'm not under Satan's authority. I'm not under the world system any longer. I'm now living from heaven's ways. You are following after the ways of the Lord. It also, remember, the reason that you get baptized with water is because it's an answer of a good conscience before God. Again, 1 Peter 3, 21. The answer of a good conscience before God. Why would, how, what's a good conscience before God? We can't be a closet Christian. We can't be one who won't stand up and declare that we've received Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. A good conscience before God is you're going to declare the fact that you have been born again.
again and you now belong to Jesus and you have nothing more to do with the world because this is talking about water baptism, which is a public thing. And people see the things that you are doing. Water baptism is a declaration that you terminate your relationship with the world. Total separation from the world. Now you're walking in his ways. In fact, if you haven't been baptized with water since you've been born again, you really haven't publicly declared that you're through with the world. You need to publicly declare, I'm through with the world. I am now come out of that. It's really the proper procedure for being delivered from the world system, in a sense, with a good conscience before God, declaring that before him. Now, at the same time, remember, as we pointed out, there is no scripture for us having any ba scriptural baptism for infants. Infants are not to be baptized because they can't believe. It always following, follows having believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are scriptures that have been brought quite a contention in the body of Christ. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, it says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned, or he's going to be judged. There are those that have taught, if you're not baptized, you're not saved. And they have this script, this is their scripture. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You've got to be baptized or you're not saved. That's it. There's whole denominations that hold, stand on this scripture, and their whole thrust is, you have to be baptized or you are not saved. Well, we already saw that baptism has nothing to do with being saved in all the rest of the scriptures. Remember at Cornelius' house, they got born again, they received the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues, you can't have that until you're born again and saved. And what was the result? You know, then the baptism with water followed that. And we saw all these other cases where first they were born again, then they got baptized afterwards. So what is this talking about here? Notice the rest of it. But he that believeth not shall be judged. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be judged. If it said that, then that would mean that you have to be baptized in order, otherwise you are going to be judged. But notice it doesn't say anything about being baptized for the guy that's judged. It just says the guy who doesn't believe. This means that believing the gospel is what's necessary so that we are saved as far as being born again. So we'll not be condemned. Because if you don't believe, you're going to be condemned. But not being baptized does not condemn us because otherwise it would be listed here. It's not listed here. It's only the fact that we don't believe. You see, there's people that teach the, bap the water baptism regeneration that this is what's going to do it. Water baptism, as you believe and then you're baptized with water, you get saved and that's what you get born again. It's a lie. It's not the truth. Let's look at one example here over in Luke chapter 23 of something that happened. In verse 39 to 43, Here's the malefactors, remember, that were on each side of Jesus when he's hanging on the cross. One of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself of us. He, was, he had a bad attitude. The other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not, dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? If we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. Otherwise, you know, we're, we're, we're paying this price because we, we've caused this. This man has done nothing amiss. This guy hadn't done anything wrong. We did wrong, but this guy's done nothing. He said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And notice what Jesus said. And we've already talked about this before. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, now the punctuation is put in by the Greek, by, excuse me, by the translator. It's not in the Greek. There's no punctuation in the Greek. It's just the translator put it in. Verily I say unto thee, the King James says, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So we know his fate was sealed that he was going to be with him in paradise, and paradise is heaven. The thing that we pointed out when we were talking about is the word today here, is the word means this very day or what has happened today. What this is saying is, Verily I say unto you, this very day or what has happened because of what has happened today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. 
if you put the comma after today, it all makes sense. He wasn't talking about him that, him, that today you're going to be with me in paradise, which means Jesus would be in paradise that day, and he would be the same in paradise with him that day because Jesus didn't go to, up to heaven that day. He went down into the lower parts of the earth for three days and three nights. We've talked about that in the past. Before, he went down first, and if you didn't see this, we'll show you this scripture real quick. It's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9. Now that he ascended, went up, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He went down before he went up, so it meant he didn't go up that day. But the point uh, there, ha having already said that, this guy, was, his fate was sealed that he was going to go to paradise. Well, did he get baptized with water? No. He obviously believed on him. He had the fear of God before him, and he called him Lord. Therefore, that was all that he needed in order to get born again. So, in fact, if you don't get baptized, does that have anything to do with being condemned? No, we already saw that. What causes you to be condemned <coughs> if you don't believe? John 3, 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. It's not having to do with baptism. So the teaching that says that you have to be baptized with water to be saved and born again and not judged is wrong. Now let's go back to this, Mark 16, 16. This is a true statement. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Remember that salvation has many aspects to it. There's the salvation of our spirit when we get born again. There's the salvation of our soul which is getting our soul healed and restored. The salvation of our body is getting healed at this point, and eventually we'll get a brand new body, a glorified body. There's also a salvation from the world. Remember what we saw back in 1 Peter chapter 3. Again, going back to this, in verse 20, where it says they were saved through water. Of what? Of the judgment that was coming on the world the flood because of their ungodliness. The like figure, even baptism, does also save us. So baptism has an element of salvation, but what kind of a salvation? Does it bring us a new spirit? No. Does it get rid of the filth of the flesh? No, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Its salvation is the fact that an answer of a good conscience before God that we declare publicly that we have been born again and that we are through with the world and so we now are saved from the judgment that comes on the world because we have declared before God we've been born again. We have shown forth that we now belong to Jesus Christ. This is something that we should do, be, be water baptized, but the salvation aspect is not talking about getting a new spirit. It's talking about you being saved from the judgment that will come upon those who walk in the ways of the world. We're saved from the world and its judgment. Another scripture that's a quite a highly controversial for many people is Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Many people use this scripture to declare that you've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to produce the remission of sins, to cause you to have your sins washed away. Look what it says. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It looks like you're baptized in the name of Jesus for thinking that that means producing the remission of sins or all your sins washed away. Well, are, can the scripture be in contradiction? No, it never can be in contradiction. What did we already look at? And again, we're going to go back to it for a second just to show you. The scripture already said that baptism does save us in one aspect, but not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, which is sin. Therefore, that means that baptism doesn't get rid of our sins. It doesn't cause the remission of our sins, does it? We know that's true. So, what do we see here in Acts chapter 2, verse 38? What is being said here? There's some things that we need to look at. 
First of all, we see that there are two prepositions which are very important in the Greek that you have to look at in this verse. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. There's two prepositions here, in and the one for. In, you may not know Greek, but the word in, normally the Greek word translated in is one that's en, like epsilon nu, en in the Greek. That's the one that's translated that way. You see that I put the cursor over this word. Look down below. It is not en. Instead is the word epi. Epi. Epi is one that is normally translated upon, but when it is used in the dative case, it means on the basis of or because of. It depends on the case. You have to look this up in the Greek, otherwise you'll never figure this out. Here is the word epi, the preposition. Next to it, it has a dative article, definite article, and next to that is the word name, because remember it said in the name, epi, the name, and it's a dative. That means that because this is in the dative case, in the Greek, this should not be translated in, but instead it's translated on the basis of or because of. And it's emphasizing a position you've come into because of something. So the way you would translate this is, so far, repent and be baptized, every one of you, on the basis of and because of the name of Jesus Christ. It means that because of the position that the name of Jesus Christ has brought us into. Well, what's the name of Jesus do? Well, you even see back earlier in verse 21, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Didn't say anything about being baptized. You call on the name of the Lord, you're saved. There's many scriptures throughout the word. When you call on the name of Jesus, that's what produces, that's because of the position the name of Jesus Christ brings you into. The next one that we need to address is the one for, for for, this word for. It appears, if you just read this at first glance, for, you think of it producing the remission of sins, or your sins being washed away, essentially. This word for, the Greek word normally translated for, is a Greek word gar, G-A-R. But this word here is the word ice, as you see below. Ice. Now, ice is a preposition which means normally in or unto, which means it would be pointing towards a, a place that you would come into. But it also, depending on the context, can refer to a place entered into already. A place you've already entered into already. And that's what it refers to here. And the reason why you know it, because it's saying, repent and be baptized, every one, of you, uh, 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 every one of you, on the basis of and because of the name of Jesus Christ, which refers to what the name of Jesus Christ already brought us into the position of being born again. And so it's refer when it's referring to a place that you've already entered into, which is having received Jesus, this word, instead, I should be translated with a view of, with a view of, of something, or because of. With a view of, or because of. So the way you would translate this is, and there's many Greek scholars that have written papers on this to point this out. This information that I got, and I'll read this in a moment, was from a Greek professor that I talked to, who was a professor at a Greek college. But this, the way you would translate this would be, be baptized on the basis of and because of the name of Jesus Christ in view of the remission of sins. Otherwise, it's already happened. Your sins were already remitted. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. <coughs> this professor says this, and I'll quote. He says, when ice is used in the Greek text in Acts 2.38, it's not referring to the end result of baptism. That it, like it produces something. That is that baptism is for or producing the forgiveness of sin. That's where people have missed it. 
By using ice, Peter was emphasizing that they should be baptized with a view of the forgiveness of their sins. Otherwise, the fact that it had already occurred because they came into the position, having called on the name of the Lord, of having been born again. There's other places where you see the use of this that even shows you this clearer, and we'll give you a couple examples. Matthew 12, verse 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. When I put the cursor over the word at, notice what it is below, ice, which normally means into or at. And it can mean you, where you come into something, it would produce it. Well, think of this here. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. What this is talking about. They repented in view of or because of, which is the way you translate this, the preaching of Jonas. He preached, and that's why they repented. Otherwise, the repenting didn't bring them into the preaching of Jonas. Wouldn't make any sense at all, would it? Are you with me? Instead, it's saying they repented because of the preaching of Jonas in the context. Yet it used ice. You have to look at the context to determine how you translate it in the Greek. This may seem a little technical, but it ha has to be brought forth because there have been people that have believed that baptism washes away your sin when water is necessary to wash away your sins, which is error, because the other scriptures show that that's not so. Ephesians 5, verse 32 is another example. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning ice, Christ in the church. This is another one that said, it's a great mystery, but I speak in view of or because of Christ in the church. Not producing Christ in the church, if it's ice, they put concerning, but it really would be translated in view of or because of it. It's just another example of ice being used where it has nothing to do with it bringing you into something, but instead it's because of or in view of that. So this shows the fact that baptism is done after a person is born again. And we go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. First, repent. And by the way, when they say repent, what were they supposed to do? Change your mind. Remember, he said repent and believe the gospel. So, change your mind and believe the gospel. What's that necessary for? For us to get born again. And be baptized, every one of you, on the basis of and because of, as it says, the name of Jesus Christ that you called upon that produced the salvation, in view of the remission of the sins, otherwise that your sins have been remitted. In other words, it's not talking about baptism producing it, it's talking about being baptized because you've already came into it. You've already came into the place of being born again, and your sins are already remitted. That is an important point. This is quite a controversial subject in many people's um, teachings out there in the body of Christ. There's another one that we need to address. <clears throat> it's over in Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22, down, we'll begin in verse 13. Here's where he said, He's rehearsing what happened with, with, uh, when he was converted. And he came to me and stood unto me and said, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. That's when Ananias came and ministered to him when he received his sight. And the same hour I looked upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers has chosen thee, this is his ministry, that thou should know his will and see that just one and should hear the voice of his mouth and that you would be a witness unto all men of what you've seen and heard. Otherwise, he now was to go forth and be a witness of this. This is his ministry that he was going to go forth and preach the gospel. And now why tarriest thou? Arise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. People have taught. Be baptized, which is going to produce the washing away of your sins. That's what they've taught from this. So baptism is spoken of first before it washes away your sins, so the conclusion is, baptism is what washed away your sins. But that's not what it's saying. First of all, it's, when it says be baptized here, this is talking about 
It's a middle voice, which means you're being baptized for your benefit. And then when it says, and washing away your sins, that would be shown to be a result of the baptism of water, if, if that was supposed to be so. But this is now, otherwise that would be shown in the Greek, it would be some kind of result. But when I put the cursor over wash away, this is a total, another different thing, where it's commanding you also to do this in the middle voice for yourself. In other words, it's saying arise and be baptized for yourself and wash away your sins for yourself. Two different things that you do. And then it continues on and says calling upon, and this also is a middle voice down here, I mean you're calling upon for yourself on the name of the Lord. Now notice these ands. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord. What brings the washing away of our sins? It's the calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord because the calling here is a participle when we put the cursor over it, down here, it is not an imperative statement, it is a participle, which means this particular statement, it has some kind of modifying or effect upon the main verb that it's next to, which is wash away. In other words, I'm washing my sins, away my sins, and the participle is going to, it's like a verbal adjective, it's ascribing something, having called upon the name of the Lord, by calling upon the name of the Lord. So what's going to wash away your sins? The calling on the name of the Lord, not being baptized. These are all separate things. And so, the problem is that we have people that try to say, well, being baptized produced that. No, it's calling on the name of the Lord that washed away our sins. Again, just false teaching that's come out there because they haven't looked at the Scriptures. Here's another scripture that we need to look at to show you, especially addressing the fact that people say, you've got to be baptized with water, you're not saved. Well, if that's the case, hey, that, we ought to be doing that all the time. I mean, we preach the gospel, we've got to get them baptized with water right now so they're saved, right? I mean, I wouldn't want to pray for them to get born again and not baptized with water, and they might die in a car accident or something. Oh, they didn't get saved, they didn't get baptized with water. We've got to do this immediately. That's the way a lot of people approach it. They do it all in a lot of religious groups. Well, let's look at this for a moment. 1 Corinthians 1.13. Was Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. I thank God. This is Paul speaking. I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. You see, the problem was these guys were all in dissension. And he says, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. They were accusing him, you're baptized in your own name. It was like a, a competition. How many guys are you baptized? How many guys are you baptized? Everybody's baptizing, like this big competition, you know. I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. He said, the only guys I baptized was this guy Gaius, and he said, and uh, Crispus, and this household of Stephanus. Outside of that, I didn't baptize anybody. But wait a minute, Paul's coming to bring the gospel to people, right? He makes a statement, Christ sent me not to baptize. Well, if that was essential for somebody to be saved, there's got to be something wrong. Of course he'd want them to be baptized if he'd sent them to baptize, if that's what produced salvation. It was an absolute, uh, you had to have that, water baptism to be saved. Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Because what produces the salvation? The gospel. That's what does it. In fact, we know that from over in Romans 1, verse 16, where he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. What was he called to do? Preach the gospel to people so they believe it and they'd get born again. He didn't come, to pre he didn't come for salvation, to, to be baptizing people. Baptizing people was not his mission. Baptism is not what brings spiritual salvation, or Paul would have had that a priority, and God would have said, be sure you baptize everybody that you preach the gospel to. 
but he did not. That was not his priority. It was something to be done in obedience, what God tells to do, but it's not what produced the salvation. Another scripture we see, and this is another one that people say and believe, John chapter 3, verse 5 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. People that say you've got to have be baptized with water, they use the scripture. They mean being born of water is what happens when you're baptized with water. That's why they come up with that conclusion. Heard this kind of teaching before? It's false. It talks about being born of water and born of the Spirit. How can we know what born of water is all about? Look at the next verse. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Born of water is being born of the flesh. How's that? When you're physically born, that's what flesh is, you're in your mother's womb, what happens right before you're born? The water sack breaks. The water breaks and what happens? Now, then you go into the contractions and so forth, the labor for the child to come forth. You're born of water. You're immersed or submerged in the, with the water around before you come forth. The same thing is saying here, you're also born of the Spirit. Because what happens when we are born again? We are born of the Spirit, as it says. The born of the Spirit is Spirit. What's that all mean? Remember what the new birth is? What produces it? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. What does baptism mean? Immerse, submerge, and engulf in. Just as the water engulfs the baby physically when he gets born, the Holy Spirit engulfs and immerses us spiritually when we get born again. And he takes the old spirit out and the new spirit comes in. Born of water, what's it talking about? Physical birth. It has nothing to do with water baptism whatsoever. It's not even discussed in the context. Yet people will use this and say, that this refers to water baptism. They think you've got to be baptized with water in the Spirit or you can't enter in the kingdom of God. Whole denominations declare this and believe this stuff. It's all wrong. It is a lie. The other thing that people say, well, we see all those scriptures about being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so they'll say, you've got, only be, you've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus only. These are the ones that declare you've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus only. Now, why is that? Because they don't believe in the Father or the Holy Spirit as separate persons of the Godhead. They believe God is one and that all the others are titles. And it's Jesus. Sometimes Jesus is the Father, sometimes Jesus is the Son, sometimes Jesus is the Holy Spirit. That's what they believe. These are the ones that are oneness type particular groups. If you've ever come across them, you will somewhere. You've got to know this. One, this type teaching. And they say that you've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus only. And if they say that, if they find out you were baptized in the name of Jesus under the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they'll say, your baptism was no good. You've got to be baptized again because you, you haven't been baptized. You're not saved. That's what they'll tell you. It's a lie. It's not the truth. Matthew 28, 19, Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in or unto the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. This tells us that we are to baptize, acknowledging that we've come into the Godhead relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that brings us to the place of how are we going to do baptism, water baptism. First of all, you've got to be born again. You're born again first, because remember that follows believing. Secondly, you need to have, have the attitude. Remember, before they were baptized, they had to repent. Repent of be sure they were walking the right way, which meant they couldn't walk and the, they came confessing their sins, didn't they? We need to have confessed our sins. And also, the fact that we are acknowledging that we're not going to walk in the ways of the world any longer, because we leave Egypt. We come out of the ways of the world. And we're going to have a good conscience before God that we're through with it. We're, otherwise, a prerequisite is they were had to confess their sins and have tr uh, repentance of sins and walking right with God. Another thing we do, because water baptism is a public thing, we have someone give a public testimony declaring that Jesus is their Lord 
and they're following him and that how they got born again, how they received Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. And so what would you say when you're going to baptize someone? You'd say, Heavenly Father, on profession of so-and-so's faith, I baptize you. And when you do this, remember it says we do everything in the name of Jesus. So we've got to do it in the name of Jesus. We, otherwise, you're not doing something right. But we're also going to do it unto the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So you combine them together. I've had people, I've guided it this past week. I have them all the time confront you on this stuff. Say, how do you baptize, you know? They want to find out about our church, and the first, you, know, you didn't care about anything else, but how do you baptize? You know, I, I know where they're coming from, the one this guy is, you know. And so I proceed to tell them that I baptize in the name of Jesus under the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. See, if you don't baptize in the name of Jesus, they think you're totally off, and they're right, because you are to do everything in the name of Jesus. But you also to do it under the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, acknowledging the Godhead. So how would you baptize? You combine it together. And that would be the scriptural way. Now, some people just say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, that's good in a sense, but that's not really how you do it. Because this is talking about unto this relationship that you've come in to. But every time, all the other scriptures say you baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because you do everything in the name of Jesus because that's bringing the high priestly ministry of Jesus into operation, acknowledging him who he is. This is why when we baptize, we baptize in the name of Jesus, under the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, acknowledging that we've come into the relationship with the Godhead and that we have come into the priesthood. So, talking about water baptism and the doctrines of baptisms, first of all, we saw that the doctrine of baptism is plural. There's teachings of baptism. There's more than one. Spiritual baptism, there also was the baptism of repentance in the Old Testament which is not relevant for today. But today there's spiritual baptism and there's also water baptism. Only one baptism affects us spiritually, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that produced a new birth. Water baptism follows having been born again. It can occur after you're born again. It could occur after you receive the Holy Spirit, after you got your prayer language, at any time at, after you're born again. You are to prepare your way before you, and you had the passing the test, because he had him baptized in the wilderness, which is the place of testing, is that you repent of sins before water baptism. Baptism was accompanied by a confession of sins that they are making themselves right before God to become a priest. Repentance was necessary, and it did precede the rem in the Old Testament on the remission of their sins. Baptism pointed towards a change being prepared, ready for the Lord, openly confessing, acknowledging their sins, and also, remember, evidence of it was they brought forth fruit, evidence of true change, which means you're going to change your ways and you're going to declare. Otherwise, you just don't get baptized and then just think, I can walk in my own ways all the way to sin. That's no good conscience before God. You know, a good conscience before God, I'm going to walk this walk now. You know, it's not just going through the motions and then continue to walk in the ways of sin. No, there should be a repentance. Water baptism is an outward declaration to all in the world of the spiritual baptism that took place on the inside of you when you got born again. It's done in the name of Jesus and to the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. We, again, do it in the name of Jesus because of the high priestly ministry of Jesus. It's also done in the name of Jesus because you're acknowledging the fact that you've come into the order of Melchizedek priesthood as a king and a priest. You're a priest now before God. It's signifying that you now are a priest before God. You're acknowledging that. It's also, of course, shows the fact that we're not under Satan's authority, that we now have left the world. We're not under this world any longer. We're following the way of the Lord. And it's done for the answer of a good conscience toward God. Water baptism, you're declaring, I'm terminating my relationship with the world. I'm not of this world any longer. I belong to Jesus. It is the procedure, proper procedure before God that we're supposed to do for being delivered from the world system as far as declaring that before God. I am through with this world. I declare that. I'm now walking the walk following the Lord Jesus. It always follows believing, and it is. People say, well, do they sprinkle or do you immerse? It's means to immerse. 
You go down in the water, showing the old you is dead and gone, you come up out. The sprinkling thing is ridiculous. It means to immerse or to submerge. So, we see now that what water baptism is all about it essentially is an outward declaration of an answer of a good conscience to God that I've been born again, I belong to Jesus, I'm following him, I've come into the priesthood, and now, I be as I belong to him, I am through with the world, I'm walking in the ways of the Lord, I've confessed my sins, I've repented, I'm making Jesus really the Lord of my life, and I'm following him and walking in his ways. That's what we're doing in water baptism. That's what the scriptures show for. That's why you need to understand this before, oh, I'll just get baptized with water. And they'd have no earthly idea what all it's about. A lot of times they think, oh, it's going to wash away my sins. No, it's not. It's not going to wash away your sins whatsoever. What does that, of course, is it worse? You've got a brand new spirit, but how about all the sins you've committed since then? You're going to have to confess your sins and receive forgiveness, calling on the name of the Lord, receiving forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. So it certainly is, it's really a matter of obedience to God, showing forth that I have left the world and I now belong to Jesus and I'm walking that walk. It's a commitment, it's a declaration before him, obedience of what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. You can't be a closet Christian. That's why water baptism is something that everybody should have. And if you've never been baptized with water since you've been born again, then you need to be. Now, this is not something that you do five times over. Well, I've got baptized six times, so I'm ready for a seventh time. No, if you got baptized with water once when you're born again, you did it. All the rest of the times were all in the flesh. Unless you went to a Jesus only place and they said, you gotta be baptized in the name of Jesus only, you know, and you followed that, or followed a cult, you know, then there's a problem, you should be baptized again. But we wanna be baptized, if you've never been baptized with water, we're going to be doing that and we're gonna be passing around a list here, well, not passing, we'll be lacing, placing it here so people can sign up if you never were baptized with water. Say this with me, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father. In, the Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word that brings the revelation of the doctrine, the teaching of baptisms. I understand there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit and there is water baptism. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the one spiritual baptism that brings change in my life, bringing forth a new birth, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Where the old spirit is gone, a brand new spirit comes in, the spirit of Jesus Christ. And I've come into the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, because I'm now a king and a priest. And I now am free from Satan's authority and I make my declaration publicly. I am through with the world. Baptism does save me from the judgment that comes on the world because I'm not walking in the world any longer. I'm now walking in the word of God after God's ways. So I do re repent and confess all sins and turn from them and make the commitment before God, an answer of a good conscience, that I am following the Lord. I will not walk in the ways of the world. I have left Egypt. I'm not giving place to the devil any longer. I'm through with him. I'm now following the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, that I have been baptized by the Holy Spirit when I got born again, and I get water baptized after I'm born again as a believer in Jesus Christ, declaring I'm through with the world and I'm following the Lord all the days of my life. Thank you, Father, for the revelation of the doctrine of baptisms so I will understand what is scriptural in line with your word regarding the teaching of baptisms. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. So we know that water baptism, if you haven't been baptized with water, it doesn't mean you're condemned. That's a lying teaching. We know that if you're baptized 
in a certain way, you know, Jesus' only way or whatever, you're not condemned. All these different teachings. Or that someone says, well, your sins aren't forgiven because you weren't baptized of water. Again, that's a lying teaching as well. I trust this has helped you. Because if you haven't run into these kind of teachings, you will somewhere down the line. I've run into them all, multiplied times over. And you've got to have the scriptures and know the truth so you do not allow yourself to be deceived and follow after something that's contrary to the Word of God. One thing, of course, is why most people don't know this, because they don't understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the new birth. By one Spirit, and we've given this scripture, and we'll just show the scripture before we close. This is a problem in the entire full gospel, Pentecostal, charismatic world. They have taught that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is after you're born again. You've been born again, now you need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's the prevailing term. Yet, it's false. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. You came into the body of Christ when you got born again. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the new birth. Call, make sure that you call the baptism of the Holy Spirit what it is after the new birth. And when you come across other people, you know, they're, they're going to refer to something after that. What's the experience whereby the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us? It's the receiving of the Holy Spirit, not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Scripturally, when we look at all the scriptures, it's called receiving the Holy Spirit. So, praise God. I trust this has helped you. And that if you haven't been baptized with water since you've been born again, we'll have our sign-up list. We'll be putting it down here for anybody that wants to, and we will be having a water baptism in the near future as soon as we've seen how many people want to do this. Father, we thank you and praise you for all you brought forth. We'll be hearers and doers of your word. Thank you for knowing the truth. Thank you, Father, that for those that have, to, that have never been baptized with water since they've been born again, that they will get baptized with water in obedience to your word. And we all understand that we've left the world and we're not about to ever walk in it ever again. Thank you for all that you've accomplished and thank you for the truth regarding the doctrine of baptisms. In Jesus' name, amen.